Okay, so welcome to this next video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the use of homologous recombination to fix double-strand breaks, okay, in DNA. So this is uh, going to be on a mechanism of um, DNA repair, specifically where we're looking at the repair of a double-strand break within the DNA. Okay, right. Um, so, the structure then for this video, what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off by talking about double strand breaks, okay, uh, but which by the way are often abbreviated DSBs, okay, and then we're going to um, talk about what homologous recombination actually is, and then we'll talk about uh, how we start with the detection of a double strand break and then how we work our way through uh, to repairing this double strand break with um, homologous recombination. Okay, right, uh, so uh, let's start off then by discussing what a double strand break actually is. So let's start by drawing a piece of DNA here and double strand breaks can occur because of ionizing radiation often. Okay, so remember ionizing radiation consists of X-rays, gamma rays, uh, those are the electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, forms which uh, count as um, ionizing radiation, but it can also count as uh, beta particles and alpha particles as well. Okay, so let's have our DNA here in uh, blue. Okay, and then some ionizing radiation is going to uh, strike the DNA and it's then going to result in a double strand break. Now, double strand breaks will very rarely be clean, okay? Uh, so often when people show double strand breaks, what they'll draw is something like this, okay? Uh, now, this is good because it gets the basic concept of what a double strand break is across, okay? It gets the concept that the two strands are both broken and therefore the whole uh, double stranded piece of DNA has split into two fragments, okay? But very rarely will um, a double strand break occur when the ends are perfectly blunt like this. And usually what will happen is you'll end up with overhangs, basically. So let me show this now. And also, remember, we're just firing in ionizing radiation here. So often it will make a complete mess. So you'll get some nucleotides that are completely blasted off all over the place, basically. So what is more likely to occur is you'll end up with overhangs uh, on the side that faces away from uh, where the ionizing radiation came from. Okay, because that's getting a less uh, intense blast from it. Okay, so let's colour this side in blue. Okay, so um, here then is a picture of a double strand break. And now it's a little bit more messy. We've um, got uh, these overhangs, okay, on the same side note. And also, what you have to note is that um, some nucleotides might have been lost in between the last nucleotide of this portion and the first nucleotide of this portion. I, it isn't necessarily the case that this portion, if we stuck it back onto this portion, would return us to this strand here. There might have been a few nucleotides in the middle here, let's say here, that were lost uh, when the ionizing radiation st struck. Okay, so let's colour in this ionizing radiation here in orange. Right. Okay, so that's um, what a double strand break is then. Now, uh, double strand breaks can be repaired by two mechanisms, okay? Now, one of the main, well, there's two main mechanisms anyway. Uh, the two main mechanisms by which DNA can DNA double strand breaks can be repaired are homologous recombination, which is often just abbreviated to HR, okay? So this stands for homologous recombination. And then the other uh, mechanism by which uh, double strand breaks can be repaired is by something called non-homologous end joining, which is often just abbreviated to NHEJ, like so. So this stands for non, that's the N, then H is for homologous, okay, and then the E is for end, and then the J is for joining. 
Okay, right, so there are these two mechanisms in um, eukaryotic cells for uh, repairing double-strand breaks. There are a few others that are starting to be reported, but these are the two main mechanisms by far uh, by which um, double-strand breaks within DNA are repaired. Okay, right. So, we are obviously going to focus completely on homologous recombination here. Uh, but I would just like to say something about non-homologous end-joining. So, basically, in non-homologous end-joining, the basic principle of what you're going to do is you're going to tidy up the ends firstly. So, you're going to cut off the overhangs. Okay, so... For instance, this strand, you're going to cut off this little overhang that we've got here. And then on the other strand, you're also going to process it and cut off that end there. Okay, so that we have two nice blunt ends now. And then what's going to happen is we're just going to attach this blunt end here to this blunt end here. Okay, and note, we do not necessarily get the same piece of DNA back again. In fact, we probably don't get the same piece of DNA back again. We may have lost a huge number of nucleotides in the middle there. Okay, so uh, after the double strand break has occurred, the DNA is never going to be the same again, basically, is the message if we fix it by uh, non-homologous end joining. And this is actually the main mechanism that the cell actually uses to repair double strand breaks. Homologous recombination is the second most common mechanism, but this is more common than homologous recombination. Okay, homologous recombination is slightly better than this. It's got a better hope of producing the uh, original strand back again, whereas this uh, generally isn't going to result in that at all. It's going to result in a few nucleotides having been emitted. Okay, right, so uh, that's non-homologous end joining then. Okay, just a brief uh, summary of what non-homologous end joining actually does. Now let's turn our attention to homologous recombination. So I want to start by talking about what recombination actually is, uh, and then what homologous recombination actually is. And then we'll go on to talking about detection of double strand breaks, and then we'll work our way through to how double strand breaks are actually repaired uh, within the cell. Okay, so uh, let's start by then talking about what recombination actually means. So what does uh, recombination of DNA actually mean? So basically, recombination means that we are going to take a section of DNA out and replace it with another section of DNA. Okay, so let me draw a picture here. So if we have our uh, DNA duplex here, which is this double-stranded piece of DNA, then recombination basically involves chopping a section of this out. So let's box this region here, and let's say we're going to chop this portion out, and now we're going to replace it with a different uh, fragment of DNA, okay, a different stretch of double-stranded DNA. Okay, so once again, I'll draw it here. But now what we have done is we've replaced that box with a different strand of DNA, and I'll colour this in in turquoise here. Okay, so this is our new strand of DNA that has replaced that original portion that was there. Okay, right, and this is recombination, this replacement of a double-stranded piece of DNA with a different double-stranded piece of DNA. This is what is meant by recombination. Okay, right. So, what then now is homologous recombination? Okay, well, homologous means similar or uh, analogous, basically. So, in homologous recombination, you're going to replace this uh, portion of double-stranded DNA with a portion that is very, very similar, if not identical to it. Okay, so that's what is meant by homologous recombination. When you are... Um, taking a section of DNA out and replacing it by a section that is almost identical, if not completely identical. That's what is meant by homologous recombination. Okay, right. It's going to perform the same function that we could um, summarize that to. Um, it, it may not be absolute... <coughs> Excuse me. It may not be absolutely identical, but it's certainly going to perform the same function. Okay, so that's what homologous recombination actually means. So, let's now then talk about um, the detection of a double-strand break. Okay, 
So, let's say we've now got our DNA here, which has suffered a double strand break, okay? So let's draw this once again here. So here are two uh, broken paths of the DNA now. Okay, right. So the first thing that binds to these uh, loose ends uh, of DNA that have resulted because of the double strand break in the DNA is going to be a complex of proteins known as the MRN complex. So I'm going to start off with a discussion of the structure of this MRN complex. Okay, and then we'll see how it's going to bind to the DNA and what's it, what its involvement is going to be. Okay, right. Uh, so the MRN complex is called the MRN complex because uh, of the names of the free proteins, well, the free types of proteins that are going to make up an MRN complex. Okay, so we're not actually going to start with the protein uh, which is, uh, well, which is the protein that begins with M. We're going to start with the protein that begins with R. Okay, so the protein that begins with R that is important in this MRN complex is a protein called RAD50. Okay, and it donates that R at the front of its name into the MRN complex's name. Okay, so let me now uh, show you the structure of an MRN protein then. Okay, so an MRN protein has a portion that is called the head, okay, down here, um, and I'm just wondering, yes, I'll show it on this side, okay, and in the head is its amino terminus and its carboxylic acid terminus, so this is a single polypeptide, okay, and then it has something called a coiled coil domain, okay, so I just want to discuss what a coiled coil domain is, firstly. So, um, in order to understand what a coiled coil domain is, we need to make sure we all understand what an alpha helix is. Okay, so proteins can form a secondary structure known as an alpha helix. And alpha helices basically look like springs. So I'll draw one of these here. Okay, so this line represents the polypeptide, it represents the polymer of amino acids, it represents amino acid after amino acid, after amino acid, after amino acid, after amino acid, etc. And we're going to continue going down further and further like so. Okay, and uh, this structure um, folded around in this way is going to be held together by interactions between the peptide links on one strand and the peptide links on the strand below it, basically. So, just to illustrate that even more, if on this little strand that I've now highlighted in, in vivid purple there, there'll be many peptide links, and the groups within that peptide link, well, within the peptide links within that pink region, will be interacting with the groups within the peptide links within this orange region below it, okay, and then so on it uh, continues on. Okay, and that's what is holding uh, an alpha helix together. Okay, so, in a coiled coil domain, you, your entire polypeptide is going to be folded up into um, an alpha helix. And then the alpha helices are going to be folded around even further. Okay, so what happens in a coiled coil domain is, what I'm now going to draw is I'm going to draw the whole alpha helix. Okay, so I am now going to demote this alpha helix to being represented as a blue line. Okay, so this blue line, it doesn't represent the polypeptide anymore. It represents the polypeptide folded round into an alpha helix. And what happens is the alpha helix is going to coil with another alpha helix like this. So it often will come back on itself like so. Okay, and the alpha helix will be folded around and coiled like so. Okay, so we've already coiled the polypeptide into an alpha helix, and now we are making a bigger structure, if you like. We're taking the alpha helical structure and we're coiling it even further around, um, around itself generally. Okay, so to make this more transparent, I'll actually try and draw the alpha helix. So here is our alpha helix here, and then the whole thing within uh, the whole polypeptide that is in this alpha helical structure is then going to coil even further, okay, like so. And then it's going to come round like so. And then the other side that's coming back here is now going to coil with the original uh, portion that I drew. 
okay like so and then this will continue. Okay, so this is the concept of a coiled, coiled domain. Uh, two alpha helices coiled round each other, basically. Okay, so remember the amino terminus is within this head region, and then it's going to give off one of these alpha helices, like so, which will come up here, like so. And then it's going to have a gap, okay? So we're going to form a region that's known as the head region, Okay, so we'll put, oh sorry, not, not the head region, this is known as the zinc hook region, the head's down here. I'll come back to these labelings in a moment. And then out of this zinc hook region, you're then going to have the alpha helix re-emerging, and then the two will coil around each other in this coiled, coiled domain fashion. Okay, like so. Okay, uh, so to try, I'll try and highlight this in blue. Okay, so here are the alpha helices in blue here. Okay, and then they're coiling around each other like so. Okay, so that is our coiled coil domain within our RAD50 protein here. Okay, so this portion right at the base here, which has the amino terminus and the carboxylic acid terminus, because remember the polypeptide is coming back into the head region, and then the carboxylic acid terminus will be within the head region. This is known as the head region, so this portion that I am highlighting in orange here. The portion in blue here is the coiled coil domain, okay? And uh, then the portion right at the top, in between the two alpha helices, which are going to coil around each other to create the coil coil domain here, uh, that portion is going to be known as the zinc hook domain. Okay, so this is the zinc hook domain, and we'll colour in the zinc hook domain in, um, I think we'll have it in, not blue, uh, turquoise. Okay, so here in turquoise, this is the zinc hook domain. Now, uh, when we form an MRN complex, we're going to actually use two RAD50 proteins, okay? So each MRN complex is going to contain two of these things, okay? And they're going to be sort of uh, mirror images of one another. Okay, so here is the zinc hook domain of this second um, RAD50 protein, okay, in turquoise here. And then we're going to have the coiled coil domain, which I'll just now draw with my blue highlighter here. And then it will come back round into um, the head region down here. Okay, so here is our head region in, which will be in orange in a moment. And there's our coil coil domain. Okay, so uh, the first portion of the MRN complex that we're currently looking at is this dimer of two RAD50 proteins. Okay, um, so uh, after RAD50 proteins, underneath the RAD50 proteins, you're going to have two more proteins. Okay, now these are separate polypeptides. Okay, and these are the next component of this MRN complex. And these are the proteins which will give the M into the name MRN. Okay, so these two proteins that we've got bound to the head regions of the two RAD50 proteins in this dimer here, uh, these are going to be called MRE11 proteins. Okay, and MRE11 stands for Myotic Recombination 11 protein. Okay, uh, so MRE11 is involved in the recombination that occurs within meiosis. Okay, uh, so that's where its name came. Its name came from. Okay, right. Uh, so um, we'll colour in the meiotic recombination 11 protein in in vivid purple here. Okay, so there's two of them. There's not just one of them uh, contributing to the MRN complex. We're going to have two of them. So just like we had two RAD50 proteins, you're also going to have uh, two MRE11 proteins. Okay, then the final protein that's going to make up the MRN complex is going to contribute the N to the MRN complex's name. And it's just going to be one protein. Okay, so we're only going to add one final protein here. And this final protein is known as MBS1. Okay, and I'll colour MBS1 here in, in yellow. Okay, now what does MBS1 stand for? Well, MBS1 stands for Nijmegen Breakage Syndrome 1. Okay, so this is the Nijmegen 
breakage syndrome 1 and it's named after uh, a quite rare syndrome uh, which results because of a mutation in this NBS protein 1. Okay, so N is for Nijmegen, uh, B is for breakage, and then S is for syndrome. Okay, so it's the Nijmegen breakage syndrome 1 protein. Okay, so uh, this then is the structure of an MRN complex, and it is these complexes which are the first things to bind to double strand breaks. Um, well, the free ends of the DNA after a double strand break has occurred. Okay, so once the double strand break has occurred, we've got these two free ends here, and MRN complexes are going to bind to each of the free ends. So this free end is going to get an MRN complex binding to it, and this free end is also going to get an MRN complex binding to it. Okay, and the way it will occur is that the um, free end of the DNA is going to come through this gap that we have in the middle of the MRN complex. So we've got this loop formed by the two RAD50 proteins. The DNA is going to go through that loop. So effectively what you're going to do is you're going to take the MRN complex and you're going to thread it onto your free end here. Okay, which you couldn't do before the double strand break had occurred. Now this is going to occur for both of them, okay? So this one will also get an MRN complex uh, bound to it. Okay, so let's show this on this picture here. Okay, so what you're going to now have is you're going to have your double stranded DNA, which is, has now got this free end here coming through this uh, middle uh, hole that you have here. Okay, right. And then the MRN complex will bind to the DNA and it will remain near the end, basically. Okay, so what's now going to happen is the MRN complex, having bound to the double strand break, is going to uh, activate a very important enzyme that is now going to activate the DNA repair mechanisms. Okay, it's going to activate the increased expression of the proteins that are then going to be involved in the DNA repair. Okay, so. Um, what we're at the moment talking about then is the detection of this double strand break. So I just feel like putting a title here. Okay, right. So um, what's going to happen is uh, NBS1 is going to activate uh, something known as a taxia telangiectasia mutated. Okay, so let me draw this here. So a taxia telangiectasia mutated is a serine threonine kinase. Okay, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. Okay, so I'll just finish writing its name first. So ataxia telangiectasia, it's a long name. And again, this protein is named after a syndrome which actually has very similar symptoms to Nijmegen breakage syndrome, uh, which is associated with mutations in this protein. Okay, so. Let's now talk about ataxia telangiectasia mutated, the protein. Okay, so this is an enzyme, okay? It's a serine threonine kinase enzyme, and I think I'll discuss what that means now. So let's go on to the other side of this page to discuss this. So uh, ataxia telangiectasia mutated is what's known as a serine threonine kinase. So, uh, this means that it's going to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues within proteins. So let's start by uh, discussing what the structure of serine residue is. Okay, so we'll start off by drawing the core amino acid structure. Okay, uh, so if we're drawing a residue, it means that I'm drawing the amino acid as though it's bound within a polypeptide. So I'm not just drawing the free amino acid, I'm drawing it as though it's bound within a polypeptide, which is why the amino group has this bond here. This bond is going off to bind to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid prior to it in the polypeptide. Then, after the amino group, we have the alpha carbon, which will have a hydrogen coming off it then the carboxylic acid group, and again, we're drawing a residue, so I'll have the carboxylic acid group uh, with this bond coming off it, which represents the bond to the next amino acid along within the polypeptide. Okay, then uh, the R group of a serine residue consists of a methylene group, like so, then with an alcohol group coming off it. Okay, so this is the structure of a serine residue. So I'll colour this in in red. 
Now, um, let's discuss also the structure of threonine. So the structure of threonine is very, very similar to serine. Okay, so once again, I'll draw the core amino acid structure. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off it, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then the R group of a threonine uh, residue consists of a very similar structure to serine. Uh, you have a carbon, which will have a hydrogen coming off it, an alcohol group coming off it, so that's all the same so far, but then it's also going to have a methyl group coming off here. Okay, so this now is the structure of the amino acid threonine. Now, for short, the three-letter code for serine is S-E-R, and the three-letter code for threonine is T-H-R. Okay, so these are serine and threonine residues. Now, serine threonine kinase enzymes are capable of phosphorylating certain serine and certain threonine residues within proteins. They have to have special flanking regions in order to actually be phosphorylated. Okay, uh, now let me explain what that actually means. So, uh, we will demonstrate phosphorylation by showing uh, what the structure of a phosphate group is and then show how you can attach phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Okay, however, I will warn you that uh, serine threonine kinase enzymes do not actually add on free phosphate groups from the cytoplasm onto serine and threonine residues. Instead, they take the phosphate groups off ATP molecules and then transfer them onto serine and threonine residues. But this will highlight the principle. Okay, so this is the structure then of a free pure phosphate group. So a phosphate group consists of a phosphorus atom double bound to an oxygen atom and then the phosphorus atom also has two alcohol groups coming off the side of it. Okay, it then also has a single bond to an oxygen atom here, and then this oxygen atom needs another electron to make up a full outer shell, and therefore it gains a further electron via ionic means, and therefore has a negative charge here. Okay, now, how can you link phosphate groups onto either the alcohol group of serine or the alcohol group of threonine? Well, um, let me highlight this group of the phosphate group here in vivid purple. Okay, so this portion, portion that I've now circled in vivid purple here, this looks extremely like a carboxylic acid group. Okay, if you imagine that that phosphorus atom is a carbon, and ignore the fact that it's got five bonds coming off it, which is clearly absurd for carbon, just look at the portion that I've circled in purple, that would be a carboxylic acid like well, carboxylic acid group, okay? So, carboxylic acid groups can react with alcohol groups. Everyone knows that. They can react via ester links, okay? And these carboxylic acid-like groups that we have within phosphate groups, these can react with alcohol groups in pretty much the same way, okay? So, what's going to happen is the alcohol group is going to come off the phosphate group, the hydrogen is going to come off the alcohol group, the alcohol group and the hydrogen are going to combine together to make water, okay? And then the oxygen of the alcohol group is going to bind to the phosphorus atom of the phosphate group, okay? And that's going to link our phosphate group onto the alcohol group of either our serine or our threonine residue. Now, this link that you create between the phosphate group and the uh, alcohol group, this is very similar to an ester link. And to draw those parallels, it's called a phosphoester link. So we're going to attach phosphate groups onto the alcohol groups of serine and threonine residues via phosphoester links. And this is what serine threonine kinase enzymes do. They phosphorylate serine and threonine residues within proteins, and adding these phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues can change the function of the protein. Okay, right. So, back to ataxia telangiectasia mutated. So, ataxia telangiectasia mutated is one of these serine threonine kinase enzymes. Okay, so I'm drawing it in the typical way to draw an enzyme. We've got our active site here, which is actually going to catalyze the addition of the phosphate group onto the serine or the threonine residue. 
Now, ataxia telangic ectasia mutated, or ATM for short, so A for ataxia, T for telangic ectasia, and M for mutated, usually exists in an inactive dimer, okay? So, usually it's floating around, it's not uh, phosphorylating um, serine or threonine residues within proteins, and it is connected to a buddy, basically. It has another ataxia telangic ectasia mutated enzyme bound to it. Okay, right. So, when our double strand breaks are produced within the DNA, we know that our mRN complexes are going to bind at the free ends of the DNA, okay? And now, the binding of the mRN complex to the double-stranded um, break-free ends uh, is then going to allow this NBS1 protein to interact with ataxia telangic ectasia mutated dimers and activate them. Okay, so what's going to then happen is MBS1 will change conformation when the mRN complex binds to the free end of the um, double strand broken DNA. Okay, and uh, it's now going to be able to bind to one of the ataxia telangic ectasia mutated enzymes within one of these ATM dimers here. Okay, so here is one of these enzymes, and of course it's got its buddy here. Okay, now, the one which is actually bound to the Nijmegen breakage syndrome 1 protein, okay, so this one in green here that's actually made contact with the MBS1, this is now going to be activated to autophosphorylate itself. Now, actually, I should just say, this pathway which I'm showing you, it's not completely concrete. This is what we think happens, but there is still a little bit of, you know, hairiness here. Uh, there are other theories as well, but this is the leading theory, okay? So this may well change in years to come, but this is our best theory at the moment. So our best theory at the moment is that uh, the ataxia telangic ectasia mutated binds to the MBS1, okay, and that then activates the ataxia telangic ectasia mutated to phosphorylate itself. So this enzyme is going to phosphorylate a serine residue on itself, okay, so the single letter amino acid code for serine is S, so that's what this is standing for here. This is standing for serine. Okay, and it's now added a phosphate group onto a serine residue within its own structure. Okay, and when you add phosphate groups onto yourself, that process is known as autophosphorylation. Okay, so auto means self, uh, so this means self phosphorylation. Okay, so that makes sense because the ATM enzyme is phosphorylating itself. Okay, now once it has autophosphorylated itself like this, what will happen is the other ATM enzyme that was originally bound to this first one here, this will cleave away. So this second one here that isn't bound to the MBS1, this will break off, okay? And then the ATM that has phosphorylated itself and which uh, is bound to the MBS1, it remains bound to the MBS1, this is now the active one. Okay, so this enzyme is now going to be active, okay, and this serine threonine kinase enzyme now is going to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on downstream targets, and we'll discuss those downstream targets in the next video.